Hello guys, hope you're really well. It's Monday, another week of the transfer window. And today we're going to have a really interesting chat about how transfers actually work, how deals actually get done. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to say thank you so much for all the support on the channel. It's been great over the last few weeks doing these little extra videos and uh, seeing you know that you guys have really enjoyed them. Uh, please do subscribe. I set myself a mini goal of before the end of June reaching 50,000 subscribers. I really think it's possible, but it's going to take uh, one or two of you to actually click that button. It would help me out and it would make me feel like this was all worthwhile. So thank you so much. Please do that. Um, somebody pointed out that I always forget to ask for subscribers and then just tag it on the end. Um, so I made a point of doing it early on. Uh, let's see if it works. So today we're going to talk about how transfers work. And one of the reasons I'm enjoying doing these videos is they kind of give a more informal setting in which to discuss you know, how the things I know about football, the, the, the sort of my experiences within it, without having to be in print and kind of living forever in that way. So it's a little bit more relaxed and I'm sort of, it's easier to talk around things. That's why I love doing podcasts and I love doing things like this. Um, and this is a really interesting area where I think there are some big misconceptions about how deals are actually done. And I don't mean to patronise anybody when I say that. I think one of the things to blame is computer games. We all did it. We all played FIFA. We all played Football Manager. We think we know how negotiations work. And then the closer you actually get to these things, the more you realise it is different. There is a, a, a culture, a way of doing things. It's a pretty unique business in some respects, football. Um, and I just wanted to share with you my experiences of that. Now, I'm going to be talking in pretty general terms uh, about how these deals are done and it's going to be based on you know working and reporting within football um, but it is worth saying there are always exceptions to these rules uh, you know a great example would be transfer deadline day where a lot of the processes that I'm going to be describing today will happen but they will be hugely accelerated into the space sometimes of 48, 72 hours. And sometimes the chronology of events can be different because you're working so fast and within such tight confines. That is almost a, a window within itself and different rules and different etiquette kind of applies in that period. Um, so to begin at the beginning, if you are buying a player, I don't think I'll be shocking too many of you when I tell you that almost all deals are done with the player side first. So although that is theoretically tapping up, uh, I would say nine out of 10 deals happen in that fashion, maybe more, maybe even a higher percentage than that, where not only is the first contact maybe the player side, but often, quite often, there is effectively an agreement with the player side before there's even a, a formal approach to the player's club. And in most cases, that is accepted and tolerated. Uh, you know, I used the word etiquette just then, and I was thinking that's actually quite a nice word to use for how a lot of these transfers operate because... There are rules and there are laws that are written down within the FIFA guidelines, but more so, these kind of deals are governed by etiquette. Um, and that's a critical thing, is that most clubs accept that players will be approached by third parties, by other clubs, by uh, agents, potential deal makers. That's just the culture within which football transfers happen and operate. Um, so the first part is always to deal with the player. And in the first instance, that might be somebody at the club. I'm going to be speaking predominantly with relation to Arsenal because that's my audience. But I think based on what I have experienced, these rules are largely the same across other Premier League teams. The first point of contact might be someone within Arsenal's recruitment department, a scout or um, one of Edu's assistants, the assistant sporting director, somebody like that, reaching out to a player's representatives. 
whether it be the family, whether it be an agent, someone who represents the interests of that player, to express an interest, to gauge their future plans, their potential availability, their potential interest in a move. Um, and to be honest, part of the job of a scout, people say it's about watching football, that's true. But the other part of the job is maintaining those relationships, uh, knowing the agents on the scene, being aware of player movement, even in players that your club aren't particularly interested in buying, just so you have some sense of what is happening in the market. That is a big part of that job, as well as this sort of pure analysis, and a big part of Eddie's job as well. So there might be that initial approach, and it will be, like I say, most likely not from Edu himself or, or Mikel Arteta or anyone like that, which kind of gives this sort of plausible deniability to it. It's kind of all third party. Well, it's someone who works for Edu speaking to someone who represents the player rather than Edu rings player up, you know? Um, from that point on, if that went well, um, there are other things you might do. You might sound out the player's interest via other players. Um, that's quite a common approach. Um, the next step would be some sort of meeting or call with the player's representatives, most likely with Edu. And in the first instance, I think uh, by and large what they'd be laying out is the project, the plan, the vision for this player, what Arsenal can do for their career, the role they see them playing. Um, it would primarily be a discussion about that. Uh, there would probably also be some discussion of sort of ballpark figures, um, but you would be quite unlikely to get into sort of the nitty gritty of the money uh, at that stage. Assuming that, you know, that went well, then the money, the salary starts to become more of a consideration. Uh, you know, you've got Richard Garlick there, who's the contracts guy at Arsenal. He would... Uh, you know, begin putting together sort of loose wage proposals um, to sort of try and move an agreement with the player along. The next step, and at Arsenal in particular, it's proved a kind of crucial step uh, in a lot of these transfers, is a conversation between uh, the manager and the player. And maybe Edu would be involved at that point as well. And this would be arranged, uh, could be over the phone, it could be in person. This is more sensitive and more damning for the club and for the manager if it comes out. So there's often a sort of element of secrecy about it. And it's a two-way street. It is as much an opportunity for the manager to assess the personality of the player as it is an opportunity for the club to pitch themselves you know they're also this is often the first time that manager and player will speak in private and somebody like Mikel will be looking for is this person a good fit for the group have they got the attributes that I'm looking for in a new signing beyond what we know about them on a technical level they've always done the groundwork there they will have got references probably from former coaches players who played alongside them but is there a chemistry? And it's so important. And I think think how many deals get done and you see in the reporting, Mikel Arteta was instrumental to this deal taking place. And it's because he is a very compelling presenter in these one-on-ones. Um, and I think this is often where you sort of secure a player, where you get their will, their determination to join Arsenal because of the impact someone like Arteta is able to make in these conversations. Um, these are sensitive, as I say, and the timing of them is sensitive. And I know of several cases where, having eventually joined Arsenal, a player has said in an interview, well, yeah, you know, um, I, I knew I wanted to join when I spoke to Mikel Arteta uh, in May or in June, and he was, you know, told me his plans for me and the club have had to sort of say can you not uh, say that because we actually didn't do a deal with the selling club until July or August um, <laughs> so it looks bad because it is I guess tapping up but everybody's doing it uh, and it's often accepted sometimes it will be known about sometimes 
if a player is known to be leaving the club, Declan Rice is maybe an example of this, I, where you know the selling club might be very relaxed about them speaking to other parties and completely accepting about it. Other times it will be more sensitive. Um, so that's probably the final part of the player side. It can happen quite early on. And it doesn't always progress to a deal. Sometimes I know of several cases where Arteta has spoken with a player and Arsenal haven't ultimately pursued them or haven't ultimately struck a deal. Um, you know, how a player comes across in these interactions can also be very important. Um, so that's the player side. And you hope that you have that sewn up. Or if not sewn up, on the way to it. Then you've got the club side. Uh, which can happen concurrently, but you probably start it later. And the biggest misconception around transfers and these kinds of deals that I mentioned I'd be talking about earlier on is surrounds bids and offers and what constitutes an official offer. Um, the reality of these negotiations is that in almost all cases, there is much more informal dialogue that is taking place. You know, there's big reporting around a bid has gone in or a second bid has gone in or a third bid. Um, they're preparing an offer. But really that preparing an offer or that space between the bids is as important because uh, that's where the clubs are really working towards an agreement. And we'll come on to that. I, I suppose my basic point is I think we place too much emphasis on the offer and not enough emphasis on the more organic conversations that are happening between those offers. So in the first instance, a club will call another club to assess their interest in selling a player or the availability of a player. Um, there is a transfer list. There are websites and apps on which clubs can list players as available. They are not hugely widely used simply because players don't take particularly kindly to being placed on them. <laughs> and uh, clubs don't tend to find that they elicit the best fees. Because if you make it very clear that you're a player's for sale, it doesn't do a great deal for your negotiating position. So generally, you've got to call a club up and they may say, yeah, player can go, this is the price. Or they may say player is not for sale, at which point, the buying club have to make a determination about is that a negotiating position or is that the truth? Um, sometimes if, if the club says, yeah, he's not for sale and those two clubs have a good understanding and they take it absolutely at face value, that can just be the end of it. Um, and when it's not, that can be a problem. You know, I, I think back to Aston Villa's interest in Emil Smith Rowe a couple of summers ago. Arsenal were absolutely adamant the player was not for sale and Aston Villa chance their arm anyway and put in official offers I think two official offers and Arsenal were upset about that because they said look we've made it very clear we don't want to negotiate there's nothing to be done here but Villa made an assessment that there could be a deal to be done and they put the offers in anyway um, it did not go down well similarly Brighton were very insistent that Caicedo wasn't for sale in January and Arsenal uh took that as a bit of a negotiating position, which it may well have been. You know, that has been their position previously. Uh, and things didn't go great there. That was Their continued interest was not particularly well received. So sometimes when clubs say a player is not for sale, they do mean it. Um, and that can be, uh, yeah, quite a feisty moment if clubs kind of don't go with that. So... Assuming that's not what happens and assuming you, you know, there is some interest in selling the player or you think there is, you're effectively in negotiations from that point on. And the offers are, I would describe the offers as the punctuation, the exclamation marks, shall we say, that punctuate the ongoing dialogue. So it will be Edu or it will be Richard Garlick who is in that dialogue with the other club with the sporting director or the chief executive or sometimes directly the owner, depending on you know who has the real power at that club. Um, sometimes conversations happen board level to board level. In the case of the Caicedo deal, it was Tim Lewis who was negotiating with Brighton. Um, 
and these will be working towards an agreement. So it will be about Edu or Richard Garlick finding out what the club's expectations are. And that's really the job of someone like Richard Garlick in this scenario, managing people's expectations. Um, trying to find out, you know, let's say he speaks to a selling club and they say, well, we want 50 million. And he'll go, well, that's a bit steep for us. We were thinking 30, maybe. And the selling club will go, well, absolutely no way. You know, we wouldn't accept 30. And Richard, being a good negotiator, will say something like, okay, well, I might be able to get you 35. Leave it with me. So what's quite smart about that is that he sort of can play it like he's on side. Look, I want this deal to happen. I want you to be happy. But I'm bound by what the club can do. Um, so I'll do my best for you to get an offer that meets your expectations. Uh and that's kind of the dynamic. So Edu and Richard Garlick um, will be in those talks and clubs will lay out what they expect in terms of a fee. And it's kind of a, mm, that's going to be hard for me to get my board to approve that. They're the bad cop. Uh, let me go to them and see what we can rustle up. Uh, and, you know, invariably the official offer falls short of the asking price. Uh, and the initial offer will almost always be rejected in some fashion. It may be dismissed entirely out of hand. There may be a response that says, this is insulting. This is, um, you know, way off what we talked about. But it's an opening position. And I think there's always an expectation on both sides that it's going to go somewhere from there. And I, you've got to remember that. I see a lot of people angry about Arsenal low-balling. It's not low-balling. It's an opening position in a negotiation. Um, and it's how all deals are done. It's not just Arsenal. You know, look at Chelsea, uh, Manchester United coming in way below Chelsea's asking price on Mason Mount. Those two clubs gradually moving closer together. Um, that's how it works. Uh, it's how it may hopefully work on Declan Rice. It seems to be how it's working on, on Timber. Um, it's just where you meet along the line. Now, another area where fans get frustrated is why is there such a big gap between offer number one and offer number two? Why aren't they just going back the next day? There are three reasons that there are delays between these punctuation points of official written offers, which, by the way, can often just be a text message. Um, sometimes they're more formal, sometimes they're an email. But the, they're often like quite broad. So it'll be like, uh, this is your basic fee over X months. This, if we win this. This, if we win this. Um, here's a sell-on clause and quite a short little email. Um, whereas actually the deal, the contract, would be a much bigger document, which would only be drawn up once there was an agreement in place. So the three reasons that you get delays between offers are, in the first instance, uh, you don't want to look desperate. I've said in the first instance a lot. You don't want to look desperate. You don't want to give the impression that you are so keen for a deal that you're just going to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. It's a play. It's poker. You need to be calm. You need to make it look like you have other options. You need to make it look like you might walk away sometimes to get a deal done. Um, so that's the first reason. The second reason is you need approval. At Arsenal particularly, if Eddie or Richard Garlick wants to put an offer in, they need sign-off on that from the board. That is a process that can be lengthy lengthier than probably certain other premier league clubs it's often a little bit of a criticism of arsenal but you know it can take them time to get sign off on certain things from the hierarchy um it's good it provides sort of diligence and oversight but it means they don't operate quite as quickly and efficiently as some other clubs uh, that's certainly a perception that exists in the market whether or not that's fair Hard for me to know because I work so closely on Arsenal and, and not so much on other teams. Um, so you might need to say, you know, I've got to go to my board. I've got to ask them for this. They've got to consider and deliberate that. Then they've got to put together an offer. I've got to, Then I've got to say, I can't go to them with that. They'll laugh it out of the room or they'll walk away from the deal. Can you do me anything better, please, board? There might be dialogue between Edu and the board about, no, 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 put an extra couple of million in. We need to push this time on this offer. So there's an internal dialogue before there's even an external dialogue. Um, 
And the third reason is that all this time, usually that a bid is not going in, is because there is constructive dialogue happening towards a deal where all those expectations are being managed. Well, we might not be able to go to this, but we might be able to go to this. What if we put that much up front, but that much uh, in add-ons? You know, can I get a feeling from the selling club of, would that be acceptable? Can they manage expectations at their end about what's gonna be plausible? It's a slow chiseling out of an agreement in most cases. Um, are you expecting to ultimately to have an offer accepted? Pfft, sometimes, but not always. In fact, I, my personal experience is that more often than not, you're not trying to come up with this offer that's definitively gonna be accepted. You're trying to come up with an offer that is good enough that the selling club comes to an agreement that this the negotiation is going to reach a conclusion. So you might not meet all their demands, but you present an offer that's good enough or close enough that they go, right, this deal is gonna happen. Let's meet in person and hammer out the specifics. Or let's have a bit of back and forth about this clause or that clause or that payment being over X months rather than Y months. Um, but from that point on, this kind of goodwill and a tacit agreement that a deal is in place, right? Or a deal is going to be done. That's the thing. It's actually quite unusual, I think, that an offer goes in and the selling club replies to that email and says, yes, we accept. What is more common is that you enter a kind of final stage of negotiations where everyone is on the same page broadly and it's just about the detail of that deal. Um, and that's how it's done. And obviously it's complicated if there are other parties involved. So if there are other bidding clubs, you know, you enter this situation where there's a lot of clubs or agents turning around to a buyer and saying, well, we've got X on the table from them. Uh, and you don't always know if that's even true. So you have to hope, and this is where I guess the Declan Rice situation becomes relevant, you have to hope that you have the player's commitment and agreement and that can be leveraged in the negotiations with the club. Um, I hope that was interesting and helpful, just a long one this one, but I think it's really fascinating stuff. It's stuff that continues to interest me and I'm still learning all the time and I see part of my role as being how can I explain the information and the things I hear from inside football to people on the outside who want to know more because that's what I would want right that's what I'd want to read or listen to or, or indeed watch um, and a lot of you will say well we knew all this and that's fine but um, I hope nonetheless it provided some sort of insight uh, yeah that'll do for this one as I said, see if you can nudge me over that 50k before July. It would um, be a nice little tick on my sort of to-do list. And hopefully we'll have some more exciting videos coming up. We've got potentially a couple of signings in the works in Havertz and Timber. Looks like it'll get done sooner rather than later. So, yeah, hopefully we can do some good content around those guys. But I'll speak to you all soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>